Nature has an efficiency that we don't recognize because we have artificial moral hypocrisies that we impose on how nature is supposed to be and ought to be, as Nietzsche said, instead of what it is. And so the wisdom of seeing both sides simultaneously and seeing the hidden order in the apparent chaos allows us to maximize our full potential on earth and to be able to love instead of judge our environment. Because when we actually are humbled before the magnificent intelligence that's permeating the universe, we, we actually fall in love with life instead of judging and thinking we need to fix it. Dr. John Demartini, welcome on the show. What are you most excited about right now in your life? Well, right now I'm I'm working on a neurology text, and I've been fascinated by the brain. I used to teach neurology many years ago, over forty something years ago, mm. and um, just bringing it up to date and exploring consciousness and its relationship between brain function, life, physiology, consciousness, and the field of, uh, you might say, the quantum fields that make up nature. Yes. I'm fascinated by that. So I'm, that's one of the projects I'm working on. I have many projects, but that's one of them that I'm currently working on that I mm. hope to finish by October. Well, Dr. John, before we get into anything, I just wanted to let you know and you know this, but I wanted to say, it, and people will find out throughout the conversation, you are a genius and you apply your wisdom. So it's an honor to have you here, brother. Um, one really fascinating topic that I think right now is at a center point is, as you mentioned, consciousness. And I think a lot of people are starting to get this sort of tingling sensation that there is a shift going on right now on the planet in terms of consciousness, awareness, um, more people are open to new ideas and new concepts. You said that you don't believe in mysticism because eventually we will have the capacities to understand the mysteries of the universe. That's what you've dedicated the last decades of your life to. So I love to have your pulse and your take around the evolving consciousness um, that is happening right now on the planet in the human species and where sort of where you think we're headed right now as a collective <laughs> so <laughs> i like to start in the shallow end you know <laughs> get, get, get the pistol ball out and and, and protect huh? um well if we look at the development of thought just it it reflects the development of the human brain hmm. you have a subcortical area of the brain which is involved in survival and you have a cortical brain that's involved in, in thrival. One is avoiding predator and seeking prey, avoiding phobias and seeking philias, avoiding challenges, seeking support, and dividing up our mind into polarities. Hmm. It's a dualistic part of the brain. And it wants survival. It fears the loss of food and it fears being eaten. So it's the mortal self. Hmm. And we also have one that transcends that, that integrates the pairs of opposites simultaneously, that sees things objectively, not subjectively. That's a thrival oriented where we maximize our potential, where we able to transcend those polarities and labels the things that occupy space and time of mind and distract us and allow us to be present and integrated and whole. And this executive functioning allows us to anticipate with foresight instead of living in the lowest heuristic, which is hindsight and reacting. We're proacting and anticipating. And so the evolution of consciousness is the evolution from our subcortical to our cortical, from our victim of history to our mastery of destiny, from the duality that polarizes and divides and separates and, you know, names the inevitable and divides the indivisibles to that which is an integrative whole, a synthesis and synchronicity of all compromise opposites where we maximally 
express our potential and actualize it as a self-actualized being, that's the evolution of it. So I'm fascinated by that. The future is the integration of pairs of opposites inside the human psyche and the simultaneity of these pairs of opposites being in full conscious awareness instead of dividing ourselves into conscious and unconscious proportions. The ratio of our perceptions determine the level of conscious evolution we have. So there's an evolution to it, and I think that's going to continue. That will be the integration of the genders, integration of the moralities, the hypocrisies, the integration of the things until we discover a hidden order in the apparent chaos and are sitting in awe in presence instead of in judgment and past and future, living in the entropy of the mortality. We're now waking up our immortal pathway. So I think that's the journey of this, this conscious involvement. And I'm fascinated being, you know, exploring that and participating in that and doing my part to exemplify what's humanly possible with human expression. Yeah. When you were 18, you came across this book by this German philosopher, Wilhelm Leibniz. Leibniz, am I saying that correctly? Leibniz. Yeah, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz or Leibniz. I'm not sure how it is in German, but um, yes, definitely was impacted by Leibniz. So he says that, you know, that's that mission that you're helping people to tap into right now is finding that hidden order in, in the midst of the emergent chaos that's around us. Um, that has to do a lot. And I wanted to hear your take on this with the consciousness that we hold, because as you mentioned, you know, what we're finding in quantum physics, so much of this field is plugged in with our consciousness. We are that field. And I would love to hear your take on what that process actually looks like to start beginning to see the, the hidden order behind things um, and leveraging our consciousness in order to be able to tap into that field. Claude Shannon and his predecessors, two of which got the Nobel Prize for information theory, hmm. described entropy the tendency to go from order to disorder as missing information and gravitational. So we weigh ourselves down when we divide our mind up into conscious and unconscious portions. So if we infatuate with somebody, we're conscious of the upsides, but we're unconscious of the downsides. If we resent somebody, we're conscious of the downsides and we're unconscious of the upsides. And anytime we infatuate, we tend to minimize ourselves relative to them. Anytime we resent, we tend to exaggerate ourselves. So anytime we judge, we're not only inauthentic, but we have a subjective distorted views of what we're judging and ourselves in return. Hmm. So anytime we divide things into an imbalanced racial perceptions and have conscious and unconscious proportions, the unconscious is missing information. It's where we're ignoring and that missing information is what we call disorder. So every time we judge, we go from order to disorder. Empedocles, the Greek philosopher in the 5th, 6th century BC, who is the founder of the four elements that had passed down through the ages, fire, air, water, and earth, and the fifth element, the quintessence, which is the synthesis of those elements, which he called love. The separation of the elements he called judgment or strife. So anytime we judge and have strife, internal conflict within ourselves, a state of inequity within ourselves and inequity between ourselves and others, and we've lost our deflective awareness, that is missing information and tropic and causes us the mortal aging process as a symptomatology, as a feedback to guide us back to look again for what we're unconscious of to see the whole. Our intuition is trying to whisper to us whatever we're unconscious of to make the unconscious join the conscious so we can be fully conscious to see the whole. When we see both sides simultaneously and see the hidden order in the apparent chaos the or disorder, hmm. we have love. And Empedocles described that as love. So we have access to love in every moment of our perception, moment by moment. If we take the time to ask intuitive question. What is the upside to what we think is down? What is the down to what we think is up? And see both sides simultaneously. Wilhelm Wundt, uh, about 130 years ago, who is the father of experimental psychology, said that simultaneous contrast 
awaken our full potential. But sequential contrast, where we have time and space between our perceptions of both sides, keep us aging. So entropy is the tendency to see only part of the equation, and neg entropy, which Urban Schroeder would call the life physics, is what allows us to see the whole. And neg entropy is life physics and leads to the immortal expression of life and the legacies that we dream about. And the entropy is where we actually break down because we're breaking down because we're not being authentic. We're judging. And the second we judge, we break down to make the atoms in the universe be disseminated to those organisms that will fulfill their mission of love. Mm -hmm. So nature has a way of making sure that no matter what's going on, it's maximizing the efficiency and effectancy. Mapertius called it the law of least action. Mott called it the law of least action or most efficient system. Nature has an efficiency that we don't recognize because we have artificial moral hypocrisies that we impose on how nature is supposed to be and ought to be, as Nietzsche said, instead of what it is. And so the wisdom of seeing both sides simultaneously and seeing the hidden order in the apparent chaos allows us to maximize our full potential on earth and to be able to love instead of judge our environment. Because when we actually are humbled before the magnificent intelligence that's permeating the universe, we, we actually fall in love with life instead of judging it, thinking we need to fix it. Whenever we're infatuated with somebody, we want to change ourselves relative to them. Whenever we resent, we tend to want to change them to us. Whenever we love, there's nothing to change. Parmenides, who had to kind of debate with Heraclitus, Heraclitus said that, uh, you know, things are changing constantly, but Parmenides said that we may be changing, but they're just transforming from one form to the next. The essence isn't change, it's immortal. And so I believe that if we actually know how to ask the right questions, we can see the magnificent fully non-changing uh, love that's always present, but we tend to judge and get caught in our illusions instead of see deeper and probe past our mysteries into the, the mastery of seeing love. So I'm, I'm a, be a believer that we want to ask quality questions, the quality of our life space and the quality of the questions that we ask. And if we ask the right questions that wake up our unconscious so we can be fully conscious, we see the hidden order in our apparent chaos and we now become masters of destiny, not victims of history. Hmm. A couple of weeks ago, I had an amazing opportunity to go down to Malibu and hear a conversation between two beautiful minds, Richard Rudd, the founder of the Gene Keys, and Zach Bush, Dr. Zach Bush. And they were explaining that, you know, Zach was going on this riff about that you see all the keystone species in nature, the lion, the wolf, the shark, and you put a keystone species in nature, and all of a sudden they put a wolf in Yosemite Park and the river started flowing again. And as you said, there's this intelligence of life where you put these keystone species in nature and nature has just a way of finding the balance itself. And then comparing that to the human species where, you know, we create destruction wherever we walk as we're seeing right now. And we're a species that is highly polarized. You just have to look at politics to realize that. What is our role right now? If if nature has this ability to find that balance, that equanimity, that quintessence, that love, where is humanity in this whole equation? Why are, what is our purpose? What is our purpose here? Ooh, that's a great question. Will Durant in his history of civilization and also history of philosophy uh, describe the dialectic. Zeno is supposedly attributed to it, although it's predating that, uh, with the idea that you have a proposition, you have an opposite proposition, and you put a proposition out, somebody opposes it, and eventually you both learn from each other and have a synthesis, and then you have this spiritual experience realizing the, the, the balance of opposites. Mm. And uh, Heraclitus said that there's a unity behind the diversity of the pairs of opposites. Well, that's going to go on, and, and in our body, we have an autonomic nervous system, which is for sympathetic, which is the challenge, the one that eats you and breaks you down and challenges you and, you know, fight or flight mechanism. We have the other one, the paradigm for rest and digest that builds the anabolic, the catabolic, the building and destroying inside our physiology must have a homeostatic mechanism to balance in order for us to maximize our potential. So we must have build and destroy uh, the support and challenge, the ease and difficulty. All pairs of opposites must be there. Maximum growth and development occurs at the pair of opposites. When we see one without the other and we separate them in time and space, we see the disorder and we think the world's in chaos. 
if we know how to ask the right questions and see whatever the opposite is, non-locally through an entanglement in the world, we see that there's a hidden order in the world and even humans can't mess it up. <laughs> so what I do is I, I, I take people who think there's chaos and I ask them a series of questions and then they all of a sudden are paused and poised and speechless when they see the counterbalancing force that's going on in the world. Most of us don't have a broad enough awareness to see the, the counterbalancing to whatever we're perceiving on the planet to mm -hmm. show that it actually has a hidden order going on and there's an intelligence governing the planet. And we're participating unconsciously about it. And people are thinking that they're throwing things out and destroying it, but they're actually stimulating things that actually open up new doorways and new insights. As Bucky Fuller says, pollution is future solution. Because every time we have a pollutant, we've come up with a new solutant. And then the, the solutant is the solution to that pollutant. You know, we've discovered new bacteria to take care of plastic. We've discovered new things. I was discussing with an astronomer this morning about this topic and helping him see the hidden order in the chaos. And what we do is then we realize that we're part of a bigger nature and we're participating in it. And if we're consciously doing it with awareness, we're most effective and efficient. If not, we go into one direction and we then we create the counterbalancing dialectic to go in the opposite direction. And these people are support technologists, want to go out and do something in advance and try to get ahead of the schedule. The ecologists come down and slow it back down and make sure that we're thinking about nature. And we, we're keeping a dialectic going to make sure that we maximize our potential on planet Earth. And we're developing technology that's going to, you know, make it even more efficient as we go along. But uh, we're, we're developing our brain as we go along. And we're, we're, we're actually part of an ecosystem. And we're not even conscious of what role we're playing sometimes. But there's a bigger order behind our chaos. And even humans aren't going to screw that up. Mm. Yeah, you said you're not screwed up. You just haven't asked the right questions in life. You haven't asked the right question. Every week uh, in my Breakthrough Experience program or one-on-one -on -one with somebody, um, they think they've got a problem. And then I ask them some questions and they just look at there and they go, there's not even a problem here. I said, no, you just didn't understand it. See, if you seek a, a, a behavior and become a juvenile dependent and addicted to the behavior, you attract the opposite behavior to make sure you break the addiction and in these pairs of opposites are morphing constantly and trying to help you become authentic and embrace both sides of life. So what you think is chaos is simply you being unconscious of the information that you're overlooking. And once you see the hidden variables, you see the hidden order. And then you realize, wow, I'm participating and I'm grateful for me and I'm grateful for the magnificent intelligence that's permeating the universe and keeping us in, on track. So we're actually not as off track as we think. We're just not aware. We're, we're caught in the next mystery, which will someday be a history, and we'll go on to the next one. We'll create new problems. We'll find solutions. We'll create new problems, find solutions. And the problems weren't even problems. We just thought they were because we didn't have the full information, didn't understand that there was something driving involvement here to make us move forward. Yeah, and having perspective like this, it's almost like humanity is also shifting to a new frequency because you've said the speed at which you see both sides determines the frequency that you are on. So I'd love to stay on that topic because obviously you were featured in The Secret in these movies about law of attraction. And, you know, also what I've learned is that we are creating the reality determined based off the frequency that we're operating from so this perspective of seeing things not from a highly charged emotional perspective whether even good or bad as you say it's a moral hypocrisy we can start seeing these things from you know both sides different angles but the challenge there is where do you even start when it comes to having all of the angles covered because it, maybe it's not either black or white. I know there's a lot of gray areas in, in many different situations. Where do you well, start each, with that? Each judgment has, is sometimes a composite of various judgments. But this is the thing. There's a thing called the law of heuristic escalation. It's a sociological law. And it shows that whenever somebody imposes an ideologue, comes along and puts an ideology onto society that they think is good, um, there'll be somebody else that has the opposite view to counterbalance it. Pro-guns, anti-guns, pro-life, anti-life, pro-abortion, you know, pro-wall pro in Mexico across the border, anti-wall, you know. Mm -hmm. So for every ideologue that's promoting an ide ideology, some other ideologue will come along and counterbalance it. One's trying to build, somebody's trying to destroy. Now, if they're thinking they're right and they're only seeing one side of it, they create an opposition. Every position creates an opposition to counterbalance it. 
And then they're in clash, they're in strife because of the incomplete awareness. And even the, the, the higher individual who can see both sides simultaneously sees the order and kind of chuckles and watch them fight with, with comical thinking, thinking they're going to get somewhere, but they think they're going to get rid of those bad people and get only good. And these people get over there and think they're going to get only the good and only the, get rid of the bad. And, and this is the illusion that people get trapped in. So the individual that can see neither positive nor negative instead of either positive and negative is the one that is able to walk the path of transcendence and non-attachment, as the Buddha says, instead of being trapped in the box and making yourself right. The addiction to being right, which is an amygdala response, and the addiction to fantasies, which is the assumption that your rightness can be imposed on the world, um, is probably the most humbling situation that we have to teach us to love, teach us how to not uh, be right. Because if we're right, we're blocking love. If we're actually in a state of love, we realize it's not about being right or wrong. It's about embracing the two sides simultaneously to build because that's what the body needs. You have mitosis, building of cells. You got apoptosis, destruction of cells. One's activated by the parasympathetic, one's activated by the sympathetic. You got anal anabolic, catabolic. You have reduction and oxidation. You have alkalinity and acidity. You have these pairs of opposites. You have dehydrogenase and hydrogenase in the enzymes. You have cations and anions. Everything has got this balancing act. It's a yin and yang that are there to be unified instead of divided. But we go around and we label something, and our label is what blocks us. You know, we put diagnostic labels on health conditions. And, you know, if a person pigs out and they get symptoms, and to label those symptoms unhealthy, instead of realizing that they're responses to people who are overeating and they're giving you feedback to make you eat wisely, everything that's going on in our world is a feedback to a wise individual and instead of a wrong or a fix, it needs fixing. But what happens is we block things by seeing only part of the information, and then we go thinking we're right in fixing it, and somebody comes along and goes the opposite, and then you're in class because you're, you're, you're attached to the form instead of transcending and seeing the pairs of opposites simultaneously. And want to describe that in, in 1895, trying to tell people that, but again, not everybody was willing to hear the, the wisdom of the ages. They want, it, they want the aging process without the wisdom sometimes. So the wisdom without the aging. The wisdom of the ages. That's beautiful. We'll get into that. But before that, I wanted to really dial in on this concept of sort of seeing things from that perspective. It almost sort of requires you to unplug from the matrix, the drama of this physical reality in order to see things from that, from that higher state of consciousness, we could say. How do you... No, I don't want to ask a how question. I wanted to just hear your thoughts about humanity choosing to learn from duality. And if that's something that you think is always going to stay that way, or are we going to at some point evolve to choose to learn from, from a different manner? Well, let's put it, if you study social structure, you'll see that no matter what we try to do, just like in a, a company, if everybody's a CEO, you don't have a company. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> if everybody's trying to make the final decision, you can't get anywhere. So there's a social structure, and that social structure has fewer at the number at the top and more at the bottom. And, and most social structures emerge that way based on, there's, you know, you have very few people that are Nobel Prize winners. You have very few people that are gold medalists. You have very few people that are the great business leaders, the great financial leaders, the great religious leaders, et cetera. And then you have the masses of people and the, the, you, everything is needed. All levels are needed. You couldn't function without all of them. That's why you want to learn to love all of them. But at the same time, you, the, the individuals that rise are the ones that own all their traits. And what does that mean? I always say at the level of the essence of the soul, nothing's missing in us. We have pleroma and fulfillment. At the level of the existence of the senses, we have appearance. Things appear to be missing, which means that we're judging. We got disowned parts, which are unconscious parts of ourselves. So if we infatuate with somebody, we're too humble to admit what we see in them is inside us. If we resent somebody, we're too proud to admit what we see in them is inside us. If we love somebody, we're not too proud or too humble to admit what we see in them is inside us. We have reflective awareness and an intimate connection with them because they are a reflection of us. And whatever we judge them for is a part of us that we're either too proud or too humble to admit we have. When we own it all and realize nothing's missing in us and we have nothing to judge out there, we wake up and we rise up to the top of the game. 
If we judge, we weigh ourselves down with gravitational entropy and we fall at the bottom of the game. There's more people at the bottom than there are fewer people at the top. There's nothing stopping any human being from playing whatever level they do. But when you go rise to the top, you have the accountability of caring about all the people that are working their way up. And your job is to be philanthropically service-oriented, to be able to serve them as they rise up in their awareness. And eventually you pass on and they take over the roles. But we, we're not going to have a, everybody's going to be all enlightened and all be a CEO of a big, big something. That's that's a delusion. But we will have different ladders. And, and on the planet, there will always be some hierarchical structure in order to make things work. That's the way my life is. And that doesn't mean it's bad or good. And it's just a matter of where do you want to play in the game. If you play at the top, you live by design. You play at the bottom, you live by duty. All value structures go from that which is at the top, who has the most power, to those that have the least power. You decide. There's nothing keeping you disempowered except your unwillingness to embrace the parts that you think you're missing. And when you own it and see that whatever you see in other people you have inside yourself, you play on the same level playing field. And then you to redistribute the power into your own hands and to give, give yourself now the accountabilities of serving greater numbers of people. And when you own every single trade, I think you've heard it's somewhere upward of 4,600, some number like that in, in the dictionary of human traits and half are perceived as good and then bad. When you own all of that, what gifts emerge from, what genius emerges from your being when you embrace all of that? Well, instead of having people push your buttons, you realize that they're just reflections of a part of yourself. And once you own it and love that part, there's nothing but appreciation and love for them. And you see whatever they're going through is just the same thing you've gone through in your life. And you embrace them with understanding and you have wisdom. But any trait, you know, I, I, 39 years ago, I went to the Oxford English Dictionary and I went through every possible human trait and I underlined it. And then I wrote out to the side who out there reminds me of that trait the most of anybody I know that's literally somebody I've met. And then I go in and find out where and when do I display and demonstrate that same behavior, uh, you know, until the quantity and quality is equal. Who did I do it to and who perceives me that way until I see it? it. Then when I meet people that have a reaction, instead of reacting to them, they, they may respond with a certain way. I go, I've done that. Who am I to judge them? <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> and I, as a result of it, you have a, a true empathy, not a compassion because there's nothing to suffer out there. It's just something to empathize with, to understand that I remember going through that at this time and I can embrace that and I love you. I can see that to part of me because otherwise, whatever you're judging them is a part you're trying to deny inside you. And any part you deny in you is a disempowerment. So you disempower your life by judging somebody else and judging that part of you. Whatever you're trying to get rid of, you just keep running into until you've learned to love that part. So I'm a firm believer in... in preemptively striking ahead by not waiting for people to cause a reaction in you and then go, oh, I judged and reacted. I would rather go and preempt it by going in and finding out what the traits are and then use it as a test to find out if I love that part yet, hoping to meet the people that normally push your button and see if you can do it without anything but love. If you do, then you've mastered your game. Mm, I'm seeing so many patterns right now. <laughs> by the way, you just explained that. Um, the million dollar question is, is there really only one of us then in this whole universe matrix landscape that we're, that we're living in? Well, Erwin Schrodinger, the Nobel Prize winner who gave rise to the Schrodinger equation, who took something all the way back to Giordano, I mean, to, to Giordano, Girolamo Cardano, which is on the square root of negative one mathematics, <clears throat> what they call complex mathematics. If you trace that back, he believed there was one mind. Schopenhauer, in a sense, in his in a summary of him, he, you know, you become your true self to the degree that you make everyone else yourself, everything else yourself. And the the Indian mystics said, you know, that the the microatomic and subatomics and the astronomics are all you. <laughs> that where where point to where you aren't, and anything that's not you is something you're still in denial about yourself, and you're going to play smaller because you're not owning it all. I, the hermetic teaching said the same thing, that when you come to the realization that it's all you, uh, you open up the doorway. Exactly. There's a little Kabbalah in you. That, uh, but, but if you go and study deeper in the mysteries, you, you'll realize that we could have a debate on whether it's one or many minds. Do we have individual conscious minds that are limited to a physical brain, or do we have a field of consciousness? In panpsychism, they have an idea that at the fundamental level, space, time, energy, and matter may be emergent functions out of a consciousness field. And even her talk, uh, 
Thomas Hertog in his book on the origin of time recently was taking and, and summarizing some of his insights and dialogues with Stephen Hawking. And his statement was that maybe there's a design in there. Maybe there's a field of intelligence underlying the physics of life. There's all kinds of theories out there. Um, but I don't want to uh, deny that possibility. Einstein, when I was 18, he said, it's enough for me on a daily basis to sit and, and meditate on the intelligence that permeates the universe. He considered the natural laws of the laws of the universe to be intelligent, not necessarily anthropomorphically designed by some deity made up in her own image, but a field of intelligence that's intelligence that's transcendent to human intelligence and even AI. That huh. AI and humans together will work towards awakening inside us. So mm. we're going to approximate, like a logarithmic pursuit, we're going to approximate ever greater levels of awareness as time goes on. It's inevitable. We started out as a nomad having very little reflection, going to a, a township, right, a kinship, and then a township, and then a city, and a state, and a nation, and a world. And we'll eventually solarize and eventually galactize, and who knows, cosmic web eyes as we go along. <laughs> And who knows if we aren't already galactic, right? <laughs> all we're doing is coming to, Plato says that we're all learning with through recollection. We're recollecting all the parts that we once thought we forgot. <laughs> yeah. You know, maybe, maybe it's already there. Uh, Emmanuel yeah. Kant described that there's an a priori knowledge of space and time inherent inside our own being. And the categories of Aristotle were depictions of that. So maybe there's an idea, the, the world of ideal forms that Plato described or the nomina that Kant described, Kant described. So I, I, I'm a firm believer in keeping our mind living with holy curiosity and keep expanding our awareness because there's, there, you know, whatever I know, there's always an, out, an infinite beyond that that I don't know, but I can continue to learn something more tomorrow and know some more. Great. And what do you believe is the most relevant wisdom of the ages that humanity, current state of humanity has forgotten and we're beginning to uncover right now? Where, where do you see that lying? Where, where is that? Well, I think I think that it's really the same thing that's been, you know, mentioned by great minds throughout the ages. But, you know, sometimes great minds are not understood by people that are living in survival. The average person is living in survival. They're living day to day, week to week. You know, they're not they're not thinking in terms of centuries or millennium or billenniums. <clears throat> they're thinking in small time frames. They 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 have just a few zeros after their times in seconds. But I think that the the wisdom has been handed down all along, and a few people get glimpses of it. Now, imagine a giant mirror. We'll call it the mirror of truth. And imagine that it broke and it got splintered all over the world. And each of us has a little piece of it, like a chard from a fire. We have a little piece of the mirror of truth. And slowly but surely, people can meet that person. They join that piece together, and they join that piece together. And we're in pursuit of an infinitely fractured mirror, gradually putting the pieces of the mirror together again. And the mirror reflects the great wisdom and the great perennial philosophy through the ages. And each of us have had glimpses and had our own slant on the idea. But overall, the mirror of truth is always present but some of us have different levels of awareness to appreciate it. Hmm. And it's really interesting because I've heard you define love and God in a very similar way. So this is a big topic, big concepts, but how have you gotten to know God or love and or love in your own way? Well, <clears throat> I was uh, involved in a movie called uh, Oh My God that uh, a gentleman put together, Peter Rogers, and he went around and he in, 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 uh, <clears throat> interviewed, I think, in 33 countries or something, 23 countries, something like that, and he interviewed all these religious people. And uh, he said, did God make man in his own image? Did man make God in his image? Hmm. It's an interesting question. And the answer is kind of both. We could probably answer both on that. but. Uh, if you look at the evolution, the anthropological evolution to religiosity on the planet, as Einstein would call it, you um, you start out sort of with the animistic, shamanistic kind of levels, and then you kind of go from a kind of a mystic to maybe a you know a little bit more like a mythological and more mysticism, and then you finally go into more mythology, and then you go to philosophy, and then you go to science, and then you go to eventually an abstract mathematical 
you know, Schrodinger equation with complex mathematics, which is something we can't even tangibly, phenomenologically deal with our senses, but it's an abstract symmetry and elegance and beauty and mathematical expression. And that seems to be a, a, an expression. The highest level is the perfect symmetry of complementary opposites simultaneously. So there's no time. It's just now. It's like the singularity kind of process. That would be the highest level of the divinity. And that's the very source of light, ultimately. And the, the, supposedly in the Big Bang model, right, the cold dark matter theory of the Big Bang, that when we have the, the microwave background radiation, whatever, that's when all of a sudden the, the atoms were formed enough where they could you know, express light. And it's quite interesting. But ultimately, divinity means comes from DV, divine or whatever, means light, to shine light. So I think that the photon, which is a spaceless, timeless, massless, chargeless, the extraction of the existential world into an essential state um, of light would be probably the very essence of religion, but it's also the very abstract pursuit of the science. So science and religion at that level are united. They're not a separation. And I think that that's the ultimate idea of it. And I think that's what love is. Love's the synthesis and synchronicity of all compromise opposites, transforming existential existence into the essence of being at the most ground state of ontological being. I think that's uh, the very essence of, of religion. And so we go from anthropomorphic deities that cover and protect us from our phobias and philias, and then we create fantasies and nightmare kind of mechanisms and dualities and punish rewarding systems. That's the banal aspect of religious development kind of like Kohlberg's level of moral development, all the way up to a point of where it's just pure synthesis and synchronicity of opposites when you just sit there in awe and grace and feel awe and love about life. To me, that's true religiosity at its finest. Mm. And I believe that any human being at any moment in time has access to that, but we don't ask the right questions to make us aware of that other side, and we polarize the unpolarizable and divide the indivisible, and label the unlabelable, name the ineffable, and divide the indivisible, and then we trap ourselves into the mortal construct of entropy and time, and we don't get past the existential limitations to see the essence of our being. We have access mm -hmm. to it. It's here 24 hours a day. Anytime we want to ask the right questions, there's a magnificent uh, hidden order, as Bohm would describe, a magnificent reflective hidden order going on at all times. We just haven't taken the time to look. I've, I've spent my life uh, exploring the mysteries of that and uncovering it and helping people see they had an order in their apparent chaos, and then they sit there in awe. They realize there's nothing there to fix. There's no uh, human will and divine will don't divide. They, they match. You know, free will and predestination, they match. And necessity and contingency match. Determinism and indeterminism match. There's no, dif there's no differentiation there. It's a, the law of similars and differences, law of the one and many. All the laws that are showing up in expressions in philosophy are now integrated into a state of presence, pure presence. Mm. And that's exactly what I was thinking about because there's sort of different groupings, let's say, or levels where people can be at in terms of how they see their relationship with creation. And many people are in that victimization, victim to their destiny. You know, they they have no free will. It's just whatever happens to me happens to me. Um, life is in the way. And it's almost that now we're moving toward a state where people are realizing that they have free will, my will that they can have whatever their innermost thought is and create the external reality. Um, and a lot of that was facilitated with the popularization of things like the law of attraction, the secret. And now what you're speaking about is sort of this evolution of thy will, where we're also in co-creation with this divine order and intelligence of the universe. So like walking people through those levels Mm, what are your thoughts on that? How do you move beyond well, those states same, of consciousness? It's the same game. Uh, if I'm infatuated with you and I put you on a pedestal because of the law of values, you, I will inject your values into my life and attempt to be like you want me to be for fear of loss of you. And so I will, in a sense, dissipate my authenticity uh, in pursuit of the fear of loss of you to be closer to you because I'm in fact with you thinking you have something I don't have, even though I'm just too humble to admit what I see in you inside me and it's toward there. And I'm just admiring you because it's reminding me of something I have, but I'm too humble to admit it. And, and we dim our authenticity in that process. Yeah. 
But if we ask questions, where do I have what I see in you? And where is it equal quantitatively and qualitatively? I don't fatch with you. I just love you. And if I resent you, I'm too proud to admit it. And I've got a disowned part. And it's reminding me of what I'm feeling ashamed of in the past. And you're coming in my life to point out what I feel ashamed of. And I'm dissociated and I'm covering it up with my pride. And I'm projecting onto you that oh, I wouldn't do that. But the reality is I've already done it. And I have that, that same behavior. When I level the playing field and I see them as equal and have equanimity within me and equity between myself and them, I have love for them. And I don't need to change me relative to them. And I don't need to change them relative to me. When I have nothing to fix and change, my will matches divine will. I'm not living in ought. I'm living in is, as Nietzsche said. And in that moment, I'm present. So human will and divine will occurs when you're not judging and you're just present, present, loving. They're one and the same thing. Divine will is just what is, as it is, as Om Tat Sat, as the Gita said. When you were 17, you were hitchhiking around basically the world. You were from the US to Mexico to then Hawaii um, surfing. And people listening up to this point would never in their lives think that you had a learning problem um, and you didn't know how to read. And all of a sudden now you've read probably now more than 35,000, 40,000 books at this point. No, just under the, the 31,000. 31,000. That's okay. I'm going to let that number sink into people's minds. <laughs> um, but when we talk about breakthroughs, um, I wanted to get familiar with that experience uh, that you went through in your in your teens where you were hitchhiking around the world, surfing, getting that you know life experience, that street smart, um, as your dad put it. And you came across a mentor. Um, I really wanted to know what he taught you initially that led to that breakthrough to you now going on this hunger for learning and accumulating wisdom and teaching um, because it's a really fascinating journey and story. Well, I was a street kid from 13, not nine. I, I moved from Houston, Texas to Richmond, Texas. And I, well, we bought a piece of land in the country at nine and I started traveling at nine. Um, mm. I used to ride my bicycle in every possible direction, 35 miles and come back home. Uh, when I was 11, I started uh, hopping trains. No, hitch. No, hopping trains when I was around 11 or 12, and and hitchhiking to different cities by 12 and 13. At 14, I hitchhiked out to California and down into Mexico. At 15, I panhandled enough money in Huntington Beach to be able to fly to LA to uh, Honolulu and go out to the North Shore and surf out there on the North Shore. So I was an adventurous kid that just wanted to go surfing. I had learning problems as a child. I was told I would never read, write, or communicate, never mind thing, never go very far in life. I didn't really read until I was 18. I looked at surf ma ma uh, magazines and chick magazines. <laughs> yeah. That was my education. <laughs> but <laughs> I, um, I did learn a lot from the people. You know, you meet a lot of people on the streets and, you, you know, amazing people. I got to meet Howard Hughes and I got to meet Timothy Leary and I got to meet some of the great surfers and, B.B. King and Ted Nugent and rock stars. And I mean, I got to meet a lot of people being a street kid. But I didn't really do any formal reading until I turned 18. And I started to pick a book. But at 17, right before my 18th birthday, I met Paul C. Bragg at our Sunset Recreation Hall in the North Shore of Oahu in a little yoga class. He was a guest speaker. And he spoke. And in one hour, one hour, this man with one message shifted the trajectory of my life. I was I guess I was ripe and ready at the time for to hearing his message. And he said that we have a body, we have a mind, and we have a soul. And the body must be guided by the mind, and the mind must be directed by the soul to maximize who we are. And he says that what we think about, what we visualize, what we affirm, what we feel, what we write down in space and time, what we act upon, and what we initiate actions towards becomes our destiny if it's something that's deeply meaningful and we don't give up on it. And he started to talk in ways that nobody really ever talked to me like that way. And I thought maybe I could overcome my learning problems. Maybe I could someday read and maybe I could speak properly because I had a speech impediment. Maybe someday I could read and write and, and travel the world and speak. And I had a dream that night. Uh, I think I've got a picture of it. Maybe I can show that picture here. Yes, yes. Someone it, painted it. Yeah, somebody painted this picture. Let's see if I can find this picture real quick. 
pardon me one second just to, there we go i'll find this picture and um this is the picture of uh, it's just a painting that was painted about my dream and vision hmm. Yes. It's me standing on a balcony speaking in front of a million people in front of a giant square with a with an iconic building from every major city around the world. The name of the painting is A Man on a Mission with a Vision and a Message. Wow. Wow. But that's what I saw when I was 17, that picture. And I was sharing it one day, and a guy came up to me and said, I'm a painter. I'd like to paint your picture and send it to you. And he sent that to me as a gift. It's five foot by four foot. It's a big, beautiful painting. And that sits in my office as a, as the cornerstone of the mission that I've been on for 50, almost 51 years. Yeah. It's almost like a lot of things. And, and as you were saying that I got emotional because I realized how much our visions can actually manifest into reality when we have that as a yeah. focus and focus is a big word because we're in a generation that is bombarded by distraction. So what do you do to remedy all of this distraction that's going on and people not knowing and not having a direction in life or not really knowing really if they have a vision or not? What do we do to remedy this? Well, the first thing I do, why I have on my website, uh, drdmartin.com, the value determination process, because uh, the hierarchy of your values dictates your destiny. And whatever is highest on your value, true value list, is something you spontaneously love doing. And if you do that, that's when you maximize your potential. So I try my best to help people identify what that is so they can start structuring their life, not because of external motivations, but because of intrinsic calling and drive. And what I do is I fill my day with that. I, I, I wrote down every single day what are the highest priority actions I can do today to fulfill my mission on earth for many, for at least a couple of years, every single day. And I found out what was the highest priority of the highest priority of the highest priorities. And it happened to match what I was spontaneously inspired to do anyway. And that was teach, research, and write and travel. So I only do that. I learned to delegate anything that required any extrinsic motivation and only do what inspires you from within and do that. So I teach every day. I write and read and read and write every day. And I travel the world every day. That's why I live on the ship. And I just constantly teach, research, write, travel. Every single thing is delegated. I haven't driven a car in 33 years. I haven't cooked. I, I have a concierge. I have a, a captains. I've got pilots. I've got cleaners. I got everything else is delegated to people who love doing that, who are excellent at what they do, at doing what I want to delegate. So I'm freed and I don't have distractions. And I'm too busy doing what I love to even allow the distractions in. So if you don't fill your day with high priority actions that inspire you, it's going to fill up with low priority distractions that don't by Parkinson's law. You know, the old saying that uh, the, the, the work expands to fill the time allotted. If you allow yourself to have time to do low priority, trivial things, well, don't expect a magnificent life. You're not going to live an inspired life doing low priority things. So I don't allow that in. I just stay focused on what it is. Stick to what you have that you have control over. Perception, decisions, and actions. Prioritize your perceptions. Prioritize your decisions. Prioritize your actions. Fill your day with that. You'll prosper. You'll serve more people. You'll have more fulfillment. You'll have more mastery. And you won't be distracted. And then you you don't have time for the trivia of this stuff that goes on TV, that sensationalism that tries to distract you and gets you polarized and emotional. None of that is meaningful to me. I learned that from Gandhi when I was 18. Don't waste your time on social outskirts, polarized systems, because all it is is subjective bias, misinterpreting reality and taking you off and, and trying to grab your attention. So I'd rather go on. If I'm going to do media, I'm going to share a message on media. I'm not going to watch media. I'm going to share a message on media <laughs> and prioritize what I deliver. And so I, I find myself... I don't have to be distracted because I don't have time for it. I'm too busy doing what I'm inspired to do. So fill your day with what inspires you and it doesn't get distracted by things that don't. Yeah. A really powerful story that you shared is one of your client, which was a mother who had a son of about 23 years old. And she was really worried about him because he would just watch TV all day, every day. And I think that happens a lot in our generations where we're stuck on so many options on Netflix, playing video games all the time. But then you started to work with this kid. Um, 
And finally, you took him from, quote unquote, what we thought was disengaged to completely disengage. You even created a sort of school curriculum for him that was a great aid to his passions, to things that he was interested in. Um, what was that process this, like? This, this young man, uh, the mother asked me to consult with him. And she says, I got a 23-year-old kid. He's not doing crap with his life. You know, he's as lazy, son of a gun. He's, he should be doing this. He should be doing that. Of course, she was paying for it. So he had no need to do it. He didn't have any accountability. She was paying for food and clothing and rent and everything else. So he didn't have any responsibility. But he was sitting in front of the TV watching CSI and, and, and you know, solving crime mysteries, basically. all. When I asked him, what's he doing on TV? What's the common thread to try to find out what his values were? It was all mystery solving. And I came out of there after conversing with him and I went to his mom. And I said, uh, we're going to look up right now on the Internet for how to become a, you know, and forensic scientist in the area of solving mysteries and crimes. Because that's what this kid wants to do. He says, well, that's all he does. Is watch those, those shows on TV. I said, that's his dream. That's his mission. And instead of negating it and trying to get him to do something that's not inspiring to him, why don't we find the curriculum of what it takes to do that? Well, the second we found the curriculum and looked and find out different ways of getting what he wanted, he was totally engaged in study, totally engaged in classes because he was now going to do what he loved. When somebody goes to school and they can't see how the classes are helping them fulfill what's meaningful and what's inspiring to them, they don't want to get engaged. They're, they're going to a class because they pass a test. It's going to go into short-term memory at the best and usually not remember anything after they leave. But when you're doing something you love, you're engaged. So we got this guy engaged. When the mother woke up and saw that this was his path, not just a lazy thing, she goes, oh, my God, this, this is I can't believe I didn't see the obvious. His room is filled with it. Any magazines, any books he studies is about that. That's because he knows what he wants to do, but he wasn't allowed to do that in his mind, right? He was having to endure this other stuff. But a lot of kids already know what they want to do. Their life is demonstrating it and helping them awaken it has been throughout. I mean, all the way back to the ancient Greeks, the great philosophers warned people not to do the other, but to allow people to find out their gift, their dream, their, their, their metier. And if you do, they, they shine, they, they excel. Mm. And you mentioned that we, at some deep, innate, intrinsic level from within, we know this, we know what we are passionate about already. Well, we Is know this... it's not a passion. Let, let me rephrase that. Because gotcha. passion, if you go to the word passion, and it comes from pasio or pati, which means to suffer. I don't use the word passion because most people throw that out there. They don't realize if you look it up, Right now, if you look up passion etymology. etymology, it means suffer. So I don't uh -huh. want to suffer people suffering. I don't want people to have compassion and suffer with people. That to me is for the masses. If you want to master your life, you want to have a mission, an inspired mission, not an animal passion. So an animal passion is a seeking of, of, of avoiding pain and seeking pleasure. A mission is embracing pain and pleasure in the pursuit of some great cause that serves humanity, that gives you deep meaning and fulfills a mission of contribution. And to me, that's a mission. And I'd, I'd rather be on a man on a mission than I would be a guy that's a passion. The seven deadly sins were called the passions of Christ. Gluttony and sloth and wrath and, you know, greed and all that. Those are the passions. I have no interest in the passions, but I'm interested in a man on a mission. And in your perspective, I know this is a big question, um, but I love the way your thought process goes about it. Mission, is this something that is coming from our personality, ego, self? Or is there another aspect of ourselves, we can call it the soul, that came with a mission on in this time in humanity to express and align itself with that mission? Well, our, our voids determine our values and our voids are all our judgments. The summation of all of our judgments is trying to create a most efficient path. As we accumulate it, the path is changing. But all of our judgments are creating voids. Because we're too proud or too humble to admit what we see in others inside us. Those are emptiness, missing parts. Those voids want to be filled to teach us how to love all those parts. So as we accumulate them, our mission is changing because it's always constantly keeping current with all of the accumulation of judgments that we have in our life. The second we balance things and have an EI ratio, excitatory and inhibitory ratio in the brain that's balanced and the autonomics are balanced, we have a gamma synchronicity in the brain. We integrate those and we're now living authentically and that's our mission. 
So our voids determine our values. The hierarchy of our values dicta dictates our destiny. Our destiny is changing as our values change. The summation of all our destinies is our life journey. And we're here to transform our passions into our mission of being a love and inspiration to the world. We have the capacity to do something different. We can't make a difference fitting into everybody else, subordinating to other people or subordinating and judging people. We can make a difference by loving people and communicating respectively with a fair exchange our mission in terms of their mission. If we respect them as an equal, we'll treat them with a dialogue, not an alternating monologue. And that dialogue and the dialectic that emerges from it helps both individuals emerge and expand and to prosper. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating how you said that our destiny changes with our values. And when I look at my own life, you know, I hit this rock bottom at 20 years old, freshman year of college. And from that point on, all of a sudden, I awakened that curiosity that you also tapped into from a very early age. And from then on, it just became this thirst for acquiring knowledge and learning. Um, a word that I learned recently, uh, philomath, is this love of learning. And that became one of my values. And that guided this podcast, that guided a lot of different things that are going on around me in my life, this new path, new destiny. So it's really interesting that I find found that out at a, you know, stage, you know, in my 20s. Um, and I'm very curious to see if maybe values will shift and change by the time I reach my 30s or 40s. Yeah. So what well, values have changed will. for you? Yeah. Yeah, they will. The, in my case, learning and teaching has been there for 50, 51 years. But yeah. what I'm teaching is evolving. Huh. What so has there's changed? A, there's a void. Because if I solve a mystery, I go, okay, what's the next mystery? Now I'm working on the next mystery. But I, my main mystery is I wanted to find solutions. I had a dream since I was 18 to master my life. I had a dream to create original ideas that served human beings across the planet, particularly in my field of philosophy and, and, and psychology and human behavior. I wanted to create a, a global business. I wanted to make sure I had students in every country on the face of the earth, which 2016 we achieved, and we have now. I wanted to have financial independence. I'm now 50 times what I originally set as a goal. So I want to have financial. So I work because I love to, not because I have to. I want to have a global family. So that's why I live on the ship called the world, because the whole world is home. And I want to have a, a, a you know a global influence and meet amazing people that do extraordinary things. Anybody that's, that had a global influence, I want to hang out with those people. So I do. Then I also want to have a vital energy, because I'm going to be 69 here in a few months. I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I got as more energy than most people in their 20s, and I put in more hours than most people. And they go, why do you do that? You don't have to, you, because I love to. You do it because you love doing it. And I find people that are engaged in what they do are very active and engaged and inspired and full of energy people. And then mm -hmm. I also want to do something to inspire people in the world. And it doesn't have to be a religious thing. It could be something that anybody from any religion can participate in. But I want to help people see the magnificence of life. And so that's, I figured I would set that up and that would be my definition of my mastery. But whatever it is, it's a contribution. And if, if we don't have that, we don't have fulfillment. Most miserable people I meet are the people searching for immediate gratification and immediate hedonistic happiness, only to find themselves drinking their life away or drugging their life away or screwing their life away or they're caught in their passions. I don't find that as meaningful as, or, or as fulfilling as, as an eudaimonia, as Aristotle said, a well-being, a wellness, an integration. And, a, a a a learning and thirst for the magnificence in life yeah a couple of weeks before your 19th birthday your mother asked you what do you want for your for your birthday this year and what did you answer because this is a very very interesting answer for someone that was 19. well my mom asked me you know since it's a birthday what do you want for birthday i was born on thanksgiving day in america and so i was is you know november so I said, uh, well, what I want is I want the greatest teachings on the face of the earth, the greatest writings that's ever been created by the greatest minds who ever lived. And she stopped. She said, you sure you don't need a T-shirt? <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I said, no, mom, I want the greatest writings on the planet. And so she said, well, okay, well, let me see what I can do. So I walked off and she contacted her brother, who was a professor at MIT at one time and worked for Shell Oil Company, was a physicist and a chemist. And, uh, brilliant mind without a doubt he was a brilliant mind and i called him uncle ralph and uh she s said this is what john wants and he knew i had a learning problem as a child he knew i you know never finished high school and and all that so 
he, as a gift, I don't know how he got it or where he got it. Part of it, some of it was his, part of it, some he bought, I don't know. But he sent two giant six foot by six foot by six foot wooden crates on a flatbed truck to my house. And they floated it on the ground with this crane. And I went out with a crowbar and opened up all the crate. And I brought in thousands of books into my room, surrounded my book nearly five and six feet high, just enough you could reach up to get them. And just and had a little yoga mat, little yoga sheet in there to face the window for a sun salute. And was doing yoga and reading. And I was in heaven, man. I just and it was every imaginable ology and discipline, science, religion, philosophy, you name it. He had it there. And he sent that as a great gift. And that was a great catalyst. You know, I spent 20 hours a day pretty well reading after that and doing a little meditation and sleeping four hours a day. 35 years, I slept only four hours a day because I just wanted to consume as much information as I could. So I'm very grateful for my mom's listening that day and getting that uh, great gift. That's where I came across Leibniz. That's where I learned about Leibniz uh, and his discourse on metaphysics and on perfection. Yeah. For someone or everyone listening, let's say their next birthday, they get to ask Dr. John for that same present for their birthday, the greatest teachings on the face of the earth. If you were to pick five of those, for people to start off on their journey toward this pursuit of of their genius, what would you leave behind for that? Well, I would probably tell them to go to Mortimer Adler's book, Syntopic and Volumes 1 and 2 by Britannica, the great books of the great idea series. Huh. I think that, that two volumes uh, would be the two greatest volumes of education the human being can start with. That would be mm -hmm. the two volumes. Just those two volumes. They're probably eight or nine hundred pages each. Um, I've got them on my computer. I they I've been carrying them around since I was about twenty one years old. I carried them around in hard copy wherever I went, and I love these books. I've gone through them with a fine tuned comb. I think that's the PhD on life, and it's a great start for any human being who wants to go and master life. It's great. What it is is the greatest ideas by the greatest minds who ever lived over the last two thousand seven hundred years all the way back from Thales, the, the Greek philosopher, all the way to today, and the great ideas that they contemplated about how to master life, it's all there and summarized in the piece. It's a great it's a great piece of literature. Mm -hmm. Two volumes. Yeah, we'll leave that for people in the description, that recommendation. One of the last topics I wanted to cover with you is, I know you are an expert in neurology, understanding the brain. It almost seems like the last decade, more information has come out about the importance of the gut, even finding that there are neurons in the gut. So I would love to hear your take on this transition between you know, going from the head into the gut, that aspect of our body. Well, we have not only an enteric brain, a gut brain, which is the seed of impulse and instinct, what we seek, which represents food, from the duodenum, of the small intestine all the way to the mouth, that's the impulse. From the duodenum all the way to the anus, that's the instinct. One is taking it in, the other is putting it out. Seek, avoid. Attract, repel. Take in, let out. So that gut brain is there for survival. It's a, a survival center. And it is the seed of gut impulse and instinct. Then we also have another part of the brain, which is the intracardiac network. It's a neurologically, um, you might say, stimulatory uh, impulse generating systems in the heart. And that's where when we actually have authenticity and we have an integration, the heart is now in sync. And then we have a brain that has a supracortical and subcortical area of the brain that relates to the gut or relates to the heart. So for living in systems one thinking, we're down into gut impulses and instincts. And we're in the amygdala and hippocampus storing up impulses and instincts for the subconscious mind. And then we have the superconscious mind, which is the medial prefrontal cortex, which is basically where the genuine of the corpus callosum unite and everything unites at that point at the medial integrated center. It's the most, it's the seat of the self according to Scientific American October edition 2022. And basically, it basically describes it. And when that's turned on, the heart integrates. And you have a complete synchronous heart rate. And you have a, cons a consistent integration of now the brain with gamma synchronicities, the heart set upon a synchronicity, and the gut. So everything is now integrated. So we have literally a gut brain, a heart brain, and then a brain with a subcortical and supracortical areas 
that are designed to keep those either in survival when we see emergencies and have an imbalanced perspective or thrival when we see a balanced perspective, either sequential contrast or simultaneous contrast. We wake these up. So the gut brain is basically there to let us know when we're in survival and when we're not seeing both sides of things and therefore we react. And the heart is letting us know when we've acted, not reacted, where we have pro foresight, not hindsight. So we have the two feedbacks from the, the gut and the heart. One's below the diaphragm, one's above the diaphragm. And then the yogis knew that to regulate both of them is to be able to master the breath. As the breath wanders, so is the mind. As the mind wanders, so is the breath. If we master our breath, we master both of them and keep them in sync. And that's exactly why the yogis use that to try to get a gamma burst in the brain to synchronize the entire thing to maximize mind and body to fulfill mission. It's such a divine system that we that we live in, that we inhabit um, in these bodies. So thank you so much for that takeaway. Um, Dr. John, we end every episode with a final trio rapid fire questions that you can answer in any way that you want. But before that, I know people will want to go to your work. I know your website is full packed of wisdom and information. Um, where would you send people to connect with you further? And if you have any upcoming projects you'd like to mention? Well, I'm, I mean, I'm just teaching, researching, writing, and traveling every day. But if they go to my website, drdmartin.com, they can start browsing the media section. And there's thousands of articles, social medias, YouTubes, videos, radio, television, newspapers, magazines. I've got 9,000 interviews. Um, then I've got the Demartini Show, which is podcasts. It can keep, me, keep you busy for a whole another incarnation almost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you will. And um, so that's the thing. And just let them, let your heart be your guide. Let it just see where it takes you. But I, I mean, I'm an educator, so I'm got, I put out stuff every single day on somehow putting education out there and they can take advantage of that. And then I've got lots of books and I've got videos and all kinds of stuff for people. Mm. Amazing. And the breaks are experience, so my signature program, which I've done yes. 1,184 times. And there's even a book for the breakthrough experience, which I was highlighting yeah. e almost every paragraph. I'm like, okay, that's <laughs> wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. <laughs> Yeah, I've got four new books out this year. I've got a fifth one coming. Um, so the last one is The Essentials of Emotional Intelligence. One before that was The Productivity Factor, How to Do Twice as Much in Half the Time. The one before that was um, The Resilient Mind, How to Have Resilience and Adaptability. And the one before that was The Seven Secret Treasures on How to Maximize Your Overall Areas of Life. Mm. Well, brother, I resonate so much with your work. And it's almost like, you know, we, we found each other to make this episode happen. Um, for the final trio, I really love this section because the first two questions are personalized to the guests and the final one we ask at the end of every single episode. The first one goes like this. What is the secret left out of the secret? Don't waste your time on pursuing uh what you classify as a goal, unless it's congruent with what you value most. So it differentiates a fantasy from a true objective. Go after true objectives. Don't waste your time on fantasies. Don't subordinate to the world around you. Ordinate within you. We're not here to compare ourselves to others. We're not here to put them on pedestals or pits. We're here to compare our daily actions to our own highest values and just look at how congruent we are. If we do that, we end up being an influencer and then exemplify what's possible as a human being. So stick to what's priority to you. The second one is what modern mystery are you dedicated right now to understand and maybe even solve? Well, I've been interested in anything that maximizes human awareness potential. So when people are disempowered by grief or relief, I found a solution to that. They've got depression or elation. I found a solution to that because both of them are delusions, both sides. So anything that's stopping people from mastering their life and maximizing their physical and mental potential, I'm working on it. And there's always new mysteries and new insights as research is coming in with new data. So I'm working on that every single day of my life. And what is the biggest limiting factor for people right now that you found? Uh, subordinating to outer authorities and living in moral hypocrisies that are unobtainable. The fastest way to disempower a society is to promote a moral hypocrisy that nobody can live by, and people are beating themselves up, comparing themselves to an idealism instead of actually honoring the magnificence of all of their sides, all parts of themselves. You don't need to get rid of any part of yourself to love yourself. Huh. 
Start loving all parts and quit and trying to get rid of half of yourself. And the moral hypocrisy that you mentioned is things such as good or bad or success or failure. Is that, is that what you, yeah, you mean by that? Polarity. Any, every time you try to get kind without cruel, nice without mean, positive, not negative, any one side of a pair of opposites is futile. They come as a pair like a magnet. They're entangled. You try to separate the inseparables and divide the indivisibles. All you do is frustrate yourself. It's like if I gave you a, a magnet and I said, here's a magnet. Uh, if you can give me one side of the magnet back, just the positive pole, without the negative pole, I'll give you a billion dollars. <laughs> if you're dumb, you'll be trying to do it. If you're smart and you knew the Maxwell's four partial differential equations, you know it's not possible. So people are pursuing that which is impossible. The, the Buddha says the desire for that which is unobtainable and the desire to avoid that which is unavoidable is the source of human suffering. And most people live there because they keep wanting a one-sided world instead of embracing both sides. And that includes peace and war and kind and cruel and all the pairs of opposites that are out there. We're, we're, a, we're a whole individual, not a part. The last question, this is the last one. <laughs> um, it's called the time capsule question because it forces us to travel a little bit out into the future around 15, 20, 25 years out. And you were given the opportunity to create and, and have a time capsule of your own. Knowing in your mind that this time capsule would be opened by the next generation of leaders. So people in the young generations now in that future will be put into leadership positions all around the world. And they would open your time capsule to find in anything, tools, techniques, wisdom, frequency frequencies, energy, whatever you want to put in there to help them birth in this new world that we're heading into. If you had the opportunity, what would you leave behind in this time capsule? I would leave my Demartini method, my method of asking questions to help you become fully conscious and get past your conscious blocks. Uh, that would be the thing. You know, it's interesting. I was uh, in Rome in 1999 near the 2000 mark, and there was a I was there on the day that 400 years earlier, Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake uh, for being a, a heretic at the time against the church. And he said that we lived, he took Lucretius's writings and he said that we live in an infinite universe with infinite worlds, with infinite beings. And that didn't go well with the church because the church was trying to, you know, put things into Aristotelian and Ptolemaic geocentric systems and limit people. And that way they had control of the whole world. And this made it look like the world was an insignificant, and there was lots of them out there. So they burned him at the stake. And I, when, I, when I read his biography, he wrote a posthumous biography of how he wanted to be perceived 500 years in the future. But this is 400 years after he died, and it, what he wrote came true. Uh -huh. I know the, the conversation I had with the astronomer today was about that, Bruno's you know, magnificence yeah. of what he did. He was so far ahead of the time. Because some of the stuff we're finding now is what Bruno was saying. Now, mm -hmm. what's interesting is, I sat down that night and wrote a 23-page automatic writing with tears in my eyes, uh, Tony, what do you call it, uh, what was it called, Jerry Maguire, Tom Cruise moment where you're sitting in tears and writing your mission. I wrote a posthumous biography there of how I want to be perceived a thousand years from now. So it wasn't just a few years in the future, it was a thousand years. And then what happened is, that was 1999, by 2008, I was asked to speak at the Milk Abbey in Austria to a conference of 200 people uh, was 12 other speakers, well, 11 other speakers, uh, some Nobel Prize winners, a Dalai Lama, a lot of interesting characters. And we were talking to solve the six major problems on the earth. And we were making contributions to six major problems. And after I spoke and all the speakers on Saturday night, they had a ceremony in the library of the Milk Abbey. And they gathered us in a semicircle and they handed us this little cylinder, stainless steel cylinder that was airtight, you know, locked. And in it, they took the Demartini method and 365 quotations from my books and calligraphied it with beautiful gold uh, leaf and put it in this thing and air tightened it. And then we walked and this, for each of the speakers, they did this. And we walked down to the end of this library room, went into the infinity of divinity library room they open up this vault where they store great scrolls for, for a long period of time, thousands of years. We went in there, and in the Infinity of Divinity library shelf, I got to put my cylinder right in the heart center of that, and they locked it in there. They said, this will be here for a minimum of a 1,000 years. 
Wow. So I wrote out the goal of what I want to do a thousand years of the future. I want my Demartini method to be there. And there it is. Now it's there sitting there waiting to be discovered a thousand years from now. In Cali That's so special. That's so special. Um, yeah, it's a tearjerker. Yeah. And when you close the time capsule on the top of it is exactly that a question that you could leave behind for the for the next generations. What would that question be? Well, the question is that uh, you want to ask yourself, um, have you done everything you could with everything you were given? Oof. That hits deep. Hmm. Yeah. I'll be thinking about that. <laughs> Dr. John from the heart, thank you so much um, for being a man on a mission and truly inspiring thousands and hundreds of thousands of lives. Um, it's an honor to share this space with you. Very sacred. Um, I really wanted to honor that. We'd love to have you back on the show whenever is possible. Really? And yeah, I'm just I'm just in awe of, of your life story and, and your work. So thank you so much. Well, remember, you, you only uh, you only had an awe of people that represent parts of you. And uh, I already know you already know you have them. So thank you for being on the journey together. We're compadres going along the line. You remind me of me. I was just a little older. That's all you're <laughs> me. So you're, on your, you're already doing it. You'll stand on my shoulders and go way farther than I've done. That's very humbling, bro. Thank you. Appreciate thank it. Thank you.